listeners and watchers now on YouTube. This is uh, Josh Bertram, your faithful co-host. Will is uh, currently figuring out his gubernatorial campaign for Virginia in 2025. And uh, I, I, I'm, I'm totally kidding, but that's where he's at. And he is, uh, so he won't be with us today. Um, but we do have with us today um, a professor of philosophy, uh, Massimo P- Piliucci. Um, thank you for being with us today, um, Massimo. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. You're very welcome. So, uh, Professor Piliucci is the uh, K.D. Irani Professor of Philosophy at the City University of New York. He holds a Ph.D. in Evolutionary Biology from the University of Connecticut and a Ph.D. in Philosophy from the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. He is a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, which has recognized him for his major contributions to the studies of gene environment interactions and his educational efforts to counter widespread pseudoscientific beliefs, which we'll get into as we as we talk. He's published more than 170 peer-reviewed papers and authored more or edited 14 books, including Nonsense on Stilts, How to Tell Science from Bunk, and the philosophy of pseudoscience, reconsidering the demarcation problem. He's written for the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, has been interviewed by PBS, BBC World Service, NBC News, the Boston Globe, the Guardian, the Atlantic, Newsweek, the Economist, Forbes, Wired, and Scientific America, and even made a guest appearance on the Colbert Report. Uh, he has a podcast called Stoic Meditations and his writings. And musings can be found at Massimo Piliucci, but it's P I G, the G is silent, L I U C C I dot com. Well, that was a mouthful, Massimo. I feel like I should, like, uh, you know, I, I don't know, be bowing down to you or paying homage to you, or maybe as the ancient Romans did, you know, putting some some uh, incense or spice in, into better the not. Uh, altar. <laughs> <laughs> I better, better, better not. not. <laughs> As a pastor, huh? I don't think that would be. Yeah, that, that would, would not be, be appropriate. No, that's right. <laughs> well, Massimo, tell me a little bit about your. I mean, I read that, but what 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 about your history? How did you get into um, philosophy? How did you get into biology? How did all this come together? Well, I started my academic career as a biologist, as an evolutionary biologist, to be precise. And that was because I always had an interest uh, in becoming a scientist since I was a kid and since I can't remember, in fact. And uh, so I pursued, you know, the the standard academic career, undergraduate, uh, then uh, doctoral studies and then a postdoc and then a position um, as a full time faculty at the University of Tennessee. And that went on for a good amount of time, and I was doing my research and being happy, funded by the National Science Foundation with my students, postdocs, and all that sort of stuff. But then at some point, I thought, all right, this has been fun so far for the last you know, 20 years or so, but do I really want to keep doing the same things for another 20 or 30 or whatever, whatever it is? And the answer was, no, nah, not really. <laughs> Now, this is not an unusual thing, actually. A lot of academics arrive, arrive at their mid career Hmm. and then start asking themselves, you know, what else can I do? Now, what was different in my case is that normally, uh, let's say a scientist in um, biology like like myself would have looked into similar fields nearby. So instead of evolutionary biology, maybe maybe ecology, maybe molecular biology or something like that, right? Uh, In my case, I decided to just jump completely uh, on the other side of campus, basically, going to the humanities uh, <laughs> side. And, uh, the soft sciences, right? The so-called soft, <laughs> yeah, the so-called soft disciplines. And uh, I enrolled in a PhD program in philosophy. And in fact, I had a friend of mine, Jonathan Kaplan, who is a philosopher of science, as my mentor there. And that's because I also had a long-time interest in philosophy, which I developed when I was in high school. In, I grew up in Italy. And in Italy, you had to take three years of philosophy in high school. And my teacher at the time was wonderful. So she really made the, the, the subject matter come alive. And even though I hadn't pursued that professionally, uh, I still had an interest in philosophy for, for a long time. So I managed to combine my two interests in philosophy on the one hand and science on the other hand by in doing philosophy of science. And philosophy of science basically is a field that looks at science a little bit from the outside hmm. in the way in which 
let's say a historian of science looks at science from the outside or a, or a, a sociologist of science uh, looks at science from the outside. So philosophers ask themselves what exactly it is that scientists are doing, how they do it, hmm. uh, could they do it better sometimes, uh, you know, that's the case. So it's, it's also a way to look at, a, uh, at science critically from the, from the outside and say, well, you know, certain things work very well, other things don't work very well. When I was in Tennessee, while during my, my time at Tennessee, I also inevitably, I guess, got involved into issues of um, the, what is called the, the demarcation between science and pseudoscience. You know, where, where is exactly this, this uh, uh, right. boundary between, between the two? And the reason for that is because, of course, as an evolutionary biologist, I was challenged by a lot of people who were creationists. And right. I started. That's so creationist, I creationist, man. Yeah, well, you know, and uh, it's Knoxville, Ten Knoxville, Tennessee, which was only, you know, thirty or forty miles from uh, Dayton, Tennessee, which is uh, was the the site of the Scopes trial in 1925, the first right. trial about the teaching of evolution. So, so I got involved into that, uh, and so I started writing and and giving public uh, lectures about the nature of science and the difference between science and pseudoscience. And when I moved to philosophy, that also came in handy because part of my interest in philosophy is, in fact, what philosophers call the demarcation problem. And the demarcation problem actually goes all the way back to Socrates. You know, right at the beginning of, of Western philosophy, there is a, a delightful uh, um, dialogue by Plato called the Carmides. Hmm. Where philosoph where Socrates asks himself, so how do we tell the difference between a doctor and a quack? Right. How, how do I how do I know that I'm going to this guy and he actually knows what he's talking about? And his his conclusion is pretty pessimistic. He says, you know, unless I myself become a doctor, I can't tell the difference. Hmm. And so it's it's interesting that uh, people have been talking about how to tell the difference between, you know. Reasonable science, good science, and and something that is not so reasonable, so good uh, for literally two and a half millennia. That's amazing. So, so what are the kind of questions? I mean, you kind of alluded to it when you're talking about philosophy of science, but when you're going through your two different, you know, trajectories of bi evolutionary biology and then the philosophy of science, what was the most striking difference in terms of the questions that you asked? In a scientific yeah. investigation versus a philosophical investigation. Yeah, that's a good question. So, uh, you know, when I was a, uh, an active biologist, my field of interest was gene environment interactions or nature nurture issues. So, I studied plants, but this can be applied to animals, human beings, whatever. And I wanted to figure out exactly how genes and environment in, environments interact uh, to yield what we look at as, as a living organism. And, um, you know, it's the kind of research you do via a combination of field work, uh, laboratory experiments, uh, you know, systematic observations, that sort of stuff. When I moved to philosophy, one of my questions, my overarching questions was how does the field of evolutionary biology itself, the theory, the fundamental theory that underlies the field of evolutionary biology, how does that evolve over time? Hmm. So, you know, Darwin published his famous book uh, on the origin of species in 1859. Now, we are a considerable amount of, of time later, and the theory has been modified significantly. You know, no, no modern biologist simply signed up on, on what Darwin wrote more than a century and a half, you know, almost two centuries ago. And so one of the questions as a philosopher was, well, how did that change? How, do, uh, how many iterations uh, can we identify of the theory of evolution? How did that happen conceptually? What, what are, what, how did the ideas change over time and why? Why is it that modern evolutionary theory is uh, different, more complex, uh, and in some cases even rejects some of the notions that Darwin presented in his book. So hmm. it's a little bit of a mix of history of science because you have to understand the history be before you realize and right. figure out why certain things happen. Uh, but also is a question of uh, conceptual change. Uh, you ask yourself, how do evolutionary biologists justify uh, what they say, uh, you know, in their textbooks, uh, how did they justify their work? On what basis do they actually uh, change their mind or not change their mind about things? So if I'm understanding correctly, so we have the, you know, science as a, uh, the scientific investigation is trying to answer questions, but it's answering questions maybe based on a set of assumptions 
about maybe how the world works. And that's been informed by the history of scientists that have come before and even the philosophy of their own age. And philosophy tries to take a step out and look at it and say, okay, how, you know, I see that you get this data, but what are your assumptions and how, on what basis do you make those assumptions? That's exactly right. It's kind of a, it's a, as you say, it's a, it's a step back and it looks at the foundation of scientific research. And, you know, it's not a, it's not a question that uh, scientists are naive and, you know, they use assumptions uh, without right. understanding it. They have to do it. Uh, they, they have to assume a of number course. of things. Otherwise, they don't get anything done. Yes. Uh, you know, but at the same time, there is also an interest in asking, well, where where do, do these assumptions come from? Do they stand up to scrutiny and, and so on and so forth? Let me give you so an analogy. Let, let, let's say that um, you are uh, presented with a practical problem, let's say fixing a car, right? Well, it's not like every time you fix a car, you go back and revisit the theory of, of you know, combustion <laughs> engine. It's like, like you know, yes. you just take it for granted that certain things work you're a in a certain way. Yeah, you're a practitioner. You, you take for granted certain things and you go back to them only in it and, and, and I, I, exclusively if things really don't work and you have no idea of why mm. they don't work. Then you might start questioning some of your assumptions. But it is interesting for somebody else to look at who doesn't actually have to bother fixing cars to look at it from the outside and say, well, isn't that right. interesting that these people are using, you know, certain notions about physics and, and, and engines and, and not other notions that they could equally use? Oh, that makes so much sense to me, you know, and I, I, I'm, I have a lot of interest at, at an amateur level in science and in philosophy of science. And when you talk about science versus pseudoscience, especially I'm, I'm especially interested because of how uh, in your time, especially living there in Knoxville, um, it was some of this clash with creationists at time that that almost like brought this question out to you that you felt like you needed to research and understand. So what what is the difference between science and pseudoscience when people throw that word around? That's pseudoscientific. That's not really show me how, how you did it. But but what is that uh, the nature of the demarcation problem? And, and, and what do you think is the difference between science and pseudoscience? Uh, that's an excellent question. So for a long time, philosophers thought that there was a pretty sharp demarcation between the two, that, you know, it's pretty clear what is science and it's pretty clear what is pseudoscience. But when they actually started trying to, to uh, articulate what kind of criteria you could actually use to separate the two, it turns out that no single criterion or even no small set of criteria was actually going to do the job because you hmm. would always have some disciplines that like look like a little bit more on the pseudoscience part, but by, but they could become, uh, you know, cross on the other side and, and vice versa. And in fact, historically, that has been the case. Like, for instance, uh, think about uh, Isaac Newton, right? We, we think of him today as a physicist. Although, of course, at the time he was a philosopher because physics didn't exist as a field. You know, science didn't exist as a field. But he considered himself a natural philosopher. Now, we think of him as a physicist because, of course, his theory of gravitation was very successful. His mechanic, his, his, his you know, uh, physical mechanics was very successful. But as it turns out, Newton spent more time during his life studying alchemy than physics. Hmm. And the only reason you never hear about it is because today we consider alchemy to be a pseudoscience. <laughs> so, you know, all that time was wasted because it didn't work out. Right. But it could have easily gone the other way around. I mean, as far as Newton is in fact, Newton himself apparently thought that alchemy was more important than physics because he yeah. spent more time doing the, the, the first one rather than the latter. So oftentimes the difference between science and pseudoscience only comes up later uh, in time. You know, you, you can't necessarily tell. At the moment, you just right. have to wait and see what pans out. For instance, and you may, let me give you an example on the other side. Uh, so uh, you may remember that a few years ago, there was this brouhaha in the physics and chemistry community about these people who allegedly had figured out a way to have cold fusion. So to, right. to uh, have a, essentially a, what is a physical process of fusion of uh, atoms uh, done at room temperature uh, with chemical means instead of, you know, in big uh, accelerators or in, or in big, uh, big machines. Well, that would have been spectacular had it worked, right? This would have made a huge difference, not only to the theory of physics and to our understanding of the world, but also in terms of, uh, you know, 
practical applications like producing energy. It would have been far uh, cheaper to produce energy that way, for instance. So for about a year or so, or two, that was all the rage uh, with papers published in major scientific journals. But then people started trying to replicate the experiments in other laboratories and hmm. they failed. They, they couldn't replicate them. And then, then they started looking more carefully at the protocol that the original authors had used and they tried to repeat uh, the experiment exactly in the way it was done and it didn't come out. Now, hmm. at some point, the scientific community, the physics community said, okay, this thing actually doesn't work. Well, what happened then was interesting. A group of diehard supporters of cold fusion started organizing its own meetings separate from the rest of the physics community. It started publishing its own papers in its own journals, doing its own peer review and all that sort of stuff. So basically, very quickly, we saw the evolution literally under our eyes. Over a right. matter of a few years, the evolution of a pseudoscience. Today, cold fusion is a pseudoscience, considered a pseudoscience. But it wasn't like 20 years ago. <laughs> when it came out, it was, it was like, okay, this sounds interesting. So it can easily go one way or the other. And again, uh, we need to sort of wait and see how things develop. Now, the case of, of uh, cold fusion gives you a good hint at how you can make, you can attempt a demarcation and, and, and what is the nature of pseudoscience. The um, community of people that believe in uh, uh, cold fusion basically now believes in something that has been, in fact, demonstrated to be false. It's, you know, it's pretty clear to the, to the scientific community in general that this thing doesn't work. But they pretend that, that, pretend that it works and they mimic science. They have, as I said, their own journal, their own conferences, their own right. etc. So that's a pretty good definition of a pseudoscience, something that pretends to be scientific, something that pretends to work in the same way in which science does. But in fact, it doesn't work. Uh, in fact, we have mm. pretty good uh, evidence that it, that, that it doesn't work. Now, there are plenty of other examples throughout the history of science and pseudoscience, one of which is astrology. So today, right. astrology is pretty much universally considered pseudoscience. Well, except by astrologers, of course. Right. Um, but, you know, if you go back 2,000 years to Ptolemy, uh, the guy that uh, actually came up with one of the first models of the uh, structure of the solar system, well, he was an astronomer just as much as an astrologer. Hmm. He, he drew no difference whatsoever between the two. For him, they were the same exact thing. They were the same but thing. But again, we remember him today as an astronomer because that part worked out. Right. But not as an astrologer because that, that, uh, that one didn't work out, didn't pan out. That see that's so fascinating to me, and and of course as a, as a Christian as a pastor, my question goes to, you know, and we'll get into some of the political aspects of this, but my my because that, the political and the and the religious are very closely tied, as you yes. can see, and um and and especially in voting habits in our country and and, and everything, and and um, that's been the way for a millennia, I think, you know, in terms of politics and religion, but um. If we're thinking about, like, let's say creationism, okay, which has, when you're talking about the cold fusion, you know, creationism, the Discovery Institute, they have right. their own maybe journals, their peer review, they have people that with PhDs that have been on it. So, so what is it? Um, so, is like what distinguishes, say, creationism? And, and a scientific or, in your, in your view, pseudoscientific pursuits of, say, creationists and their uh, uh, um, academics, creationist academics, versus, say, the more, like, renowned and well-known scientific uh, theories and scientific you know, publications and that yeah. kind of thing. Well, what, here's one difference. I, I know, actually, a number of people at the Discovery Institute. I've, I've talked to them over the years. I've actually, or occasionally even, we had you know, panel discussions or debates together. And here's one different, one, one interesting observation. Every single uh, person that is associated with the Discovery Institute is a Christian, usually an evangelical Christian. Mm. Every single one of them. On the other hand, uh, if you go, if you sample the scientific community at large worldwide, you find Christians, Muslims, Jews, right. Buddhists, atheists, agnostic. It doesn't doesn't matter. That that tells you something. It tells you that on the one side you have a pretty clear ideological bias. 
while on the other right. side, you don't. Uh, you know, I, I know that the people at Discovery Institute love to present a, a evolution as an atheistic uh, notion, but it isn't. I have a lot of colleagues in biology departments who are not atheists and who would recoil from the from the the whole notion of atheism. And nevertheless, they are evolutionary biologists. So, right there, there is an interesting difference between between the two. But the other, I think, more more important, more substantial difference is that the overwhelming consensus within biology is that uh, evolutionary theory is broadly correct, or at least approximately correct. And equally, there is a very broad consensus that creationism isn't anything that you can build on. I mean, you, you can't, you cannot use the notion of intelligent design to actually discover new things in biology, to actually bring forth a research program in, in biology. And that is why it's considered a, a pseudoscience, because it doesn't lead anywhere. It doesn't, it doesn't go anywhere. It doesn't produce uh, anything other than, of course, the reinforcement of a particular ideological uh, religious uh, you know set mi mindset now people often tell me yeah but wait a minute the experts sometimes are wrong sure of course right. they are sure uh, we're human we're all human beings right <laughs> um, but let me ask you a question not you personally but you know ask sure. the, these hypothetical interlocutor a question in return it's like so so if not to the expert where you want to go to yes. get some answers, right? So let me go back to our example, my example earlier on of, you know, you have a car and let's say that the, your car breaks down. Where are you going to bring your car? Not to the preacher, right. not to the dentist, you know, uh, you're going to bring it to a mechanic. Why? Right. Because the mechanic is an expert. Now, right. does that mean that the, the mechanic is going to always be able to solve the problem with your car? No. Because he's a human being. So sometimes he's not going to get it. Sometimes the, the problem might not be solvable at all. So if the mechanic doesn't solve the problem, what do you do now? You, now you go to the dentist or the preacher? No, you go to another mechanic. Right? <laughs> and eventually, if nobody can, if no mechanic can solve the problem, you're just going to junk the car and get right. a new one. Right? So in terms of, of sheer common sense, that's the way we work in day-to-day -day life. We go to the expert community right. or an expert within that community and we say, hey, can you fix this thing or can you tell me how this thing works? We do not assume that the experts are infallible, nor right. do we assume that we're always going to get a satisfying answer to the question. We simply assume that our best bet by far is to go to the expert uh, or the uh, or the community of experts. That applies to science as well. Science in that sense is no different from, uh, you know, if you have a problem in your car, you go to the mechanic. If you have a problem in your teeth, you go to the dentist uh, and so on and so forth. And if right. you have a problem with your faith, you go to the preacher. Right. <laughs> right. Again, you, you're not going to go to the mechanic and, and, and say, and you know, say, hey, I, I have a problem here, an issue. Of, you know, I don't understand the Trinity. Can you explain it to me? It's like, no, right. you're going to your preacher or your, or, or your priest. So one, one of the things that really uh, baffles me is that Nobody would disagree with the kind of scenario that I just presented you. And, sure. yet, and yet, a large number of Americans seem to have a problem with scientific expertise as opposed to any other kind of expertise. We have no problem right. whatsoever with other kinds of experts. But somehow, uh, when it comes to science, we kind of pick and choose. I would, also, I would like to uh, add that it's not that Americans have a problem with science in general. They only have a problem with science when it conflicts with certain ideological positions, right? Because the very same people that deny evolution, let's say, or climate change, then those very same people are attached to their iPhone and, yes. and depend on their, for their lives on their iPhone, which means that they trust science, yes. right? Because that's a scientific pr product. That's a technological yes. product. So uh, they go to the doctors. They might not go and get vaccinated for COVID because they might have certain strange ideas about COVID vaccines, but they do go to their doctor otherwise, right? Yes. If, they're, if they have uh, uh, anything from a flu to cancer, they're going to go to their doctor. Yes. So it's kind of a pick and choose. That would be like, I'm going to my mechanic, but only if the problem doesn't concern the brakes. If it concerns <laughs> the brakes, then I'm going to go to the preacher. It's like, what? No. That doesn't yes. make any sense. No, I, I, I really understand what you're saying. And, and, 
So what I, I want to just return to Christian for a second, just to make sure I can get in my mind around what you're saying is that, so it's not it, the creationism as a theory, as a, as a workable operational theory that it, it, it's, it's what you're saying is the, the structure of that theory does not enable it to make scientific progress. Whereas, um, and, and, and some of the issues that we see are number one, a very clear bias towards one particular belief system and group of people. And, and, and at the same time, um, that these, that, um, whereas evolutionary theory would span all sorts of different belief systems. Correct. Um, and, and it can be used to actually discover new things. It has been used to discover new things. Over it the has last, been used to discover know. new things. And that, right. so that makes sense. So then what we're seeing then is that this theory of creationism, and this can kind of segue us into the interaction of our beliefs, our actions, like, for instance, we talked about the COVID vaccine, which is a very, very, you know, um, uh, very clear and very, uh, what, what, what's the word I'm looking for? A very profound um, issue that we're facing right now, which, which, which um, uh, it gives us, like it materializes this conversation. Right, like, exactly. I, I, that's not the right word, but it, but. Anyway, it makes it very concrete. Yeah, it makes it very concrete because yeah, it makes it concretizes. That's a better way. Yeah. So, um, when we're talking about so so we have this theory that works, um, and and it's based on you know replicate. It's been replicated. It's been used with great success in terms of say the evolutionary theory, um, and the scientific method used with great success to make advancements to understand knowledge. This spans all sorts of different ideologies. So what we're saying is that the creationism theory is is more of a ideology than it is a scientific method. That's right. Exactly. Okay. So so how do you so what do we do when in terms of like all these different belief systems that are using science? Those are just two different types of questions scientific questions versus metaphysical questions yeah well if you're talking about metaphysical questions then of course there is a whole different discipline that deals with those questions yeah. and that's philosophy yeah <laughs> right well, philosophical so, questions yeah right so i would uh, you know if we're talking again with it comes down to who are the experts here who who is the who is the uh, relevant community of people that actually worked on these things now if you where to go if you're interested in let's say in the problem of free will which is a metaphysical issue right uh, i wouldn't go to a scientist uh to ask them you know what do you think of free will it's like Bleh, i don't know <laughs> uh you know i you cannot do experiments on free will uh there are people actually that claim that they do but it turns out they don't uh, you know, there are some neuroscientists who have made claims and on those, those, those uh, in that direction. But as it turns out, I just read a really interesting article just a few weeks ago that says, no, not really. It's, it's, neuroscience doesn't really have a lot to do with uh, free will. So if you want to, if you're interested in free will or if you're interested in uh, questions of meaning, for instance, then I would say don't go to a scientist, go to somebody who has actually spent their lives thinking about free will, that would be a metaphysician. You know, metaphysics is a branch of philosophy. If you're right. interested in questions on meaning, uh, you might want to go to an ethicist, to somebody who studies those, those questions. And there, too, you will find the exact same uh, variety from an ideological perspective, right? Right. Uh, I know metaphysicians who are Christians, Jews, Muslims, atheists, and so on and so forth. And the same goes for ethicists. And there, it, me it means that the community does not have a bias. Individuals will, right? Because uh, you, you might talk to an individual ethicist who happens, yes. happens to be a Christian, and he will give you a particular view of things. Yes. But, uh, but then you talk to another ethicist who is not a Christian, and you might say, well, actually, wait a minute, there is a disagreement here. And in those cases, it will be interesting to compare different points of view within that field of expertise and say, oh, 
well, that's interesting that if, if the expert has a particular background, he's going to get, tell, me, tell me X. And if he has a different background, he's going to tell me Y. You need to be aware of the fact that even experts can have biases, of course. Uh, and of that course. goes, you know, because they're human beings. That goes for scientists as well. As well. We all have, have biases. What makes science different from other yes. uh, sort of ways of knowing, so to speak? Ep- is that epistemology. Right. It's yeah. right. It's, a, it's an epistemological question. Ultimately, scientists have to collide with nature, with reality. You know, so you can have all the biases that you want. You can have all of the ideas that you want. But if, when you're going to do the experiment, it either it's going to work or it's not going to work. Uh, you, know, you, can, you can think, for instance, that you can fly out of the window and go up. But if you try it, you're going to fall down and smash yourself on the, on right. the pavement, uh, right? So you can, you can talk to people and say, no, no, I'm, I'm really able to fly. But ultimately, the question is, well, open the window and jump. We'll see right. what happens, right? Uh, and we know what's going to happen. <laughs> yes. So regardless of what, of what your biases might be or your ideology might be, we know exactly what's going to happen. Yes, absolutely. So, so let's shift in here to politics because this is a super interesting question to me because it baffles my mind and it's a very complex uh, question as to you know, when we're looking at America right now and the mask mandates and the COVID vaccines and the, the theories and conspiracy theories surrounding this, what seems to me is there is a conflation of scientific knowing and political knowing or ideological knowing, just like what you just said. How do you think we can tell the difference between those things, specifically politically, and separate those? Well, they're difficult to separate for, for, for a couple of reasons. First of all, if science has to be useful, it has to inform policy. Right. Um, so, so there is, which is no, politics, which is, of course, politics, which is itself, you know, uh, uh, had to do or had to deal with, with the politics. I mean, you, nobody implements policies without any, any a particular political uh, of you know, bend or on things. So, so in a sense, it's kind of difficult to estricate them. It's kind of difficult to, to tell them apart, to, to separate them, because inevitably, if you want to make scientific advice practical, then you're running into uh, policy advice, and policy advice is very near politics. Um, you know, certain <laughs> people will take the advice, and other people won't take the, the advice. So that said, however, you can distinguish between uh, the policies and the scientific advice if you pay a little bit of attention, right? So, for instance, let's talk about masks, which is about which we actually know quite a bit at, the, at this point, the efficacy or not of masks. Right. We, we, we know quite a bit about it. So what is the scientific consensus at this point about masks? Well, the data show pretty clearly that, that masks do protect individuals, although to different degrees, depending on what masks you use. For instance, cloth masks are less protective than, uh, you know, higher higher level surgical masks. And then there is, you know, the, the same the professional ones that are the most protective of all. Now, we even know how much, w- what the numbers are, right? So viral particles are filtered, you know, 99% of viral particles, 95% of viral particles are, are filtered out by the very high end masks and only about 40 to 50% uh, by the cloth masks, if, were, if, if they're worn correctly. Because if you weren't, don't wear it correctly, then all then bets are off. Obvi- and so what that means is that the virus is 40, they're thinking that 40 to 50% of the viral uh, stuff that you're breathing out um, is no, getting... No, you're breathing in. Those are protection for you. In. You're breathing in. Right. In terms of breathing out, they're almost, even the, even the cloth masks are very close to 100% protection. Meaning really? that... Right, meaning that you you're protecting other people basically quite a bit. If you so right, gotcha. okay, okay. So you're so there's protecting a, there's other asymmetry. people. Correct, exactly. So breathing out is about protecting other people. If you use a mask uh, when you breathe out, uh, you're protecting. You're not protecting yourself. You're protecting other people. And the protection that is afforded by even the simple cloth masks is very high. Okay, it's not quite a hundred percent, but it's very high. So on the other hand, if we're talking about protecting yourself. 
then a cloth mask protects you only 40, 50 percent. In, in other words, it, in, it intercepts only 40, 50 percent of the, of the particles, viral particles, and then better masks protect more. Now, at, that's the science, right? That's the best science that is available at the moment. Right. Of course, as all science, that could change. We knew far less about masks, for instance, a year ago or a year and a half ago when the pandemic started because people hadn't done that many studies about, uh, you know, we, we had not been in a pandemic for a long time, for a century. So yes. we, we didn't really have a lot, of, a lot to go on. But now this is the current consensus. And again, we should always understand that current consensus means literally the current majority opinion within science. That could change. Right. New data may come in and, 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 and you would hope that if new data comes in, the scientists do change their mind. You don't want people to stuck, be stuck on, on one thing regardless of the, of the data that comes in. But right yes. now, that's the best understanding that we have. Now, then, then we move from the facts of science as much as science can tell you to the policy. So given that given that information I just gave you, and given a number of other variables, such as the infection rate of the virus in a local community, uh, such as the fact that you may be indoor or outdoor, such as the fact that you may be vaccinated or not vaccinated, such as the fact that you may be uh, immunotolerant or not, or immunodeficient. All of these other things enter into the equation, and that's why it gets complicated, right? Yes, but once you have all of that information, then the policymaker can say, okay, given all of that, my best guess is that people should wear masks, not wear masks, wear masks under these conditions, but not others, and so on and so forth. For instance, I'm, I'm here in, in New York City, and New York City has changed and keeps changing the policy, not only because the data changed, not only because the, the information that comes from the science changed, but because the situation on the ground is different. Right. So, for instance, during the summer, for mu much of the summer, the numbers uh, in New York were fairly low in terms right. of, you know, uh, so the, the percentage of uh, people that tested positive was very low. That meant that New York did not enforce a mask mandate outdoors or if you were vaccinated, even indoors. And that policy, to my mind, made sense because what you have there is like, look, if you're vaccinated, you already have a fairly large percentage of protection. Depending on the, it varies depending on the vaccine, but you have a fairly very good protection. Not 100 percent. No vaccine sure. will protect you 100 percent, but you have a very high percentage. On top of which, the chances that you're meeting somebody indoor in that particular environment who actually carries the, the virus and is infected is very low. So balance that against the inconvenience of wearing a mask when you go to a restaurant or something like that. And, right. you know, the policymaker said, don't. You, don't, you don't need to. But now the policy is changing because the, the number of positive cases has increased in the meantime. So there is an increasing number of cases. So now my chances to meet somebody with Are a higher. significant viral law is higher, right? And I am vaccinated, but I was vaccinated six months ago. And we know that vaccines start losing efficacy after eight months. And this is all vaccines or just this? Right. Right now, I'm talking, no, not all vaccines. It depends on the vaccine. Just the ones, COVID yeah. vaccines. Yeah, COVID vaccines, even those actually vary. But the Pfizer and Moderna, which are the two major ones in the United States, start losing efficacy according to the current data after about eight months. So I got another couple of months after which I'm going to be at, at risk, right? Hmm. And so what am I going to do? Well, the more I approach the eight months mark, the more I start being careful. So right now, during the summer, for instance, I traveled, you know, with masks and everything. I went to right. restaurants uh, and so on and so forth. But if, you, if we're coming into next month or the month after that, I'm going to stop traveling. I'm going to resume wearing a mask. Until you get your uh, booster. Until I get my booster. shot. That's right. And then things will change Again, so that's the thing. It is, number one, complicated because there's a lot of variables at play. And the situation changes constantly. That's why, you know, so people complain, but, oh, but scientists change your mind. You know, one time they tell me that, this, and another time they tell me that. Well, yeah, because <laughs> the situation changes. And the data what changes. Do you want? Would you prefer, yeah, would you prefer somebody <laughs> to give you exactly the same advice regardless of what the situation is? That, that doesn't No, seem, we don't want that. Right. right. Now, of course, there is also 
mistakes. There is also exaggerations. There are people that go on television and, and make claims that are actually not substantiated by, by the best science. Uh, the best science now is much, much better than it was a year ago. So, you know, all of that enters into decisions at the level of policymaking. Uh, and that's why it's, there is no, you know, simple, obvious answer, straightforward answer to, you know, should I do this or should we do that? Well, it depends. It depends on what the situation is. Well, that makes a lot of sense. I, um, so w- one thing I was wanting to ask you is um, because of your interaction with gene and environment, and this is going to be a silly question, but I think you'll, I mean, you'll, you'll understand the heart behind it but I'm going to ask it in a silly way. Is there a Republican gene or a Democrat <laughs> gene? It's a good question. And actually, <laughs> believe it or not, some people have looked into it. Um, <laughs> the straightforward and the, the simple answer is no. Human behaviors right. are too complicated for that sort of stuff. Now, that said, there is actually research that shows that some people seem to be uh, at an innate level uh, more prone to authoritarian authoritarianism really so, yes and others are more rebellious more you know no let me let me do whatever the hell i want kind of thing however even that so there is some reason that actually shows that there may be a genetic component to that sort of stuff but even so the, you know, my research of you know, 20 plus years uh, in gene environment interaction shows that almost any complex character especially behavioral traits it's always a complex combination of genes and environments. Uh, and let me give you an example. So, Please. Uh, for instance, we, we often hear that there are people who, are, um, who have an innate talent, like, you know, kids that at five years old start be, you know, playing piano and they're, they're, you know, very, very good and that sort of stuff, right? Now, those things are real. There, there are actually, you know, very, very precocious, uh, you know, talents. However no matter how precocious that talent is, it can be improved by practice, by, hmm. in, in other words, by the environment. And in fact, even if you know nothing about music and you have no talent whatsoever, you can still learn to play an instrument by practicing. In other words, right. the environment does make a difference. So regardless of what your genetic base is, you know, are, are you genetically a Mozart or are you genetically incompetent from a musical perspective? Well, whatever you are, you are, but you can improve by practicing. Right. And that's true for both Mozart and somebody who is, doesn't have any idea of what, you know, of what music and sound uh, should, should, be, should be like. And because we cannot change the genetics, but we can change the environment, then I think the focus for our, as far as our policies are concerned, should be the environment, not the genes. The genes are what they are. You know, you're, you're, you're born with certain genetic makeup and that's it. You're not going to change, at least not for now. Uh, right. You know, people, some people are working on genetic engineering, but right now you can't do that. Uh, not not in, any, in any way. If right now genetic engineering at that level is basically science fiction still. It may right. turn out to be science reality in some, at some point in the future. But right now, you are born with the genes you have, and that's it. You're stuck with those. However, that doesn't mean you, you are fated to do things in a certain way. It doesn't mean the things are going to happen in a certain way. Let me give you two examples. One is in my family. Uh, my wife has an identical twin. And you would think, so those, by definition, those are two people who have exactly the same genes. They are very different from each other. They look the same. They look very similar, absolutely. But But their their life trajectory, yeah, their personalities, their life trajectories, what they've done with their lives is completely different. Completely. They they have absolutely nothing to do with each other, which means that the environment has a major role to play, of course, uh, despite the fact that the genes are identical. Another example that might be that, that your listeners might, might be familiar with, or at least they can check uh, very easily. So if you get a, a can of soda, like Coke or Pepsi or something like that, and you read the ingredients, right, there is uh, a warning that says there uh, that you shouldn't drink that stuff if you are a phenylketonuric. A phenylketonuric, yes. right, is somebody who has a genetic defect, uh, they cannot make an enzyme, phenylalanine, that digests 
therefore, that, you know, that, that, that digest certain components that are inside the Coke, as well as a bunch of other, uh, you know, foods. Now, if you have, if you're phenylketonuric, if you don't, if you have the defective gene, there is nothing you can do about changing that. Right. And if you're not, and, and phenylketonurics can actually develop, if they uh, assimilate a lot of phenylalanine, they can actually develop severe mental retardation. They can be really seriously developmentally uh, hampered in terms of brain development and stuff like that. And yet, there are millions of people in the world who are fit phenylketonuric and are perf- perfectly normal people. They're just like you and me. How do they manage that? Hmm. They just didn't drink Coke. <laughs> they, they, they didn't have, you know, they stayed away with their, on, the, on their diet. They stayed away from phenylalanine because they cannot process it. And that's it. Right. End of story. So now you have a genetic disease that has been basically defeated by a simple change in the environment. Just don't drink the stuff. Right. Eat some, you know, drink something else. Eat something else. Just not, not, not that one because that's going to kill you or that's going to cause serious, serious issues. So genetics is not a... Uh, it's not something that cannot be altered. You know, it's, it's not doesn't determine your fate. It's it only pauses certain constraints on what you can do or cannot do. Uh, you know, if you're a phenyl ketonuric, you cannot drink coke, right? Because otherwise, you're going to be in trouble. But you know, there is a lot more to life than drinking coke, so you can yes. do other things and be perfectly fine. So. Let, let me ask you uh, a question, just thinking about the Democrat and Republican, and then even thinking about, of course, the environmental factors beyond behind faith, behind because politics are, are ideologically informed and faith is ideologically informed. It's about basic beliefs, right? So if we're thinking about those, like the interaction of those two things, what do you think from your understanding of, 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 of philosophy and science, how do people change their minds? Like, well, what is it that, 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 okay, go ahead. Yeah, how no, there's, there's a, that's a, that's a very good question. There is a lot of research on that actually done usually by social psychologists and, you know, people like that. Uh, and so we know quite a bit about how people change their minds about things. And there are basically two I'm simplifying, but there are two major ways in which people change their mind. One is as a result of catastrophic and traumatic uh, events. Hmm. Right, so we are coming up tomorrow to, on the uh, anniversary of 9-11, for instance. And you know, a lot of people either embraced faith or, in fact, lost their faith on that day right. or the day after, you know, or shortly thereafter. Why? Because they're suddenly presented with a macroscopic event, a, a, a major thing that they not expect, that it's traumatic, and they have to cope with, with it one way or, or another. So one way in which people change their beliefs, either politically, for instance, or religiously, is as a result of a traumatic event. It doesn't have to be something as traumatic as 9-11. It could be simply your mother dying right. or, or your child dying, even, even worse. Right. Um, you know, again, people react in either one of those two ways. They either embrace religion or, in fact, abandon religion as a result of traumatic events. The other major way in which people change their mind is very slowly, over a period of months or years, and as a result uh, of multiple exposure to different perspectives. So, for instance, uh, I mean, think about back to your own life and and you know, try to, to uh, think about the times you change your mind about some major issue. Right. I, I have, I actually have a blog where from time to time I publish a, uh, an entry that says, okay, I changed my mind about this. <laughs> right. So I kind of have a record about major That's things. Cool. I mean, not, not, you know, not, not, not minor things like, you know, do I, do I prefer chocolate ice cream or yes. vanilla ice cream? Hey, that could uh, be major. <laughs> that could be major. I don't know. I, I have no idea why anybody would not prefer uh, chocolate, <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> major things. So, so it, it happens, you know, people change their mind about all yes. sorts of things. Now, if you pay attention to how that happens, I cannot think of a single case, maybe, maybe very rarely where I'm having a discussion with somebody, let's say a friend or a colleague or something. And then all of a sudden in the middle of a conversation, I say, you know what? You're right. <laughs> I just changed my mind. You just convinced me. <laughs> 
That doesn't happen for a number of reasons. Number one, because typically we don't like to say that we're wrong. And so yeah. there is a kind of a tendency you to say, say nah, face. yeah, I want to say face. But also, number two, because if it is really, if we're talking about something important, such as your political uh, allegiance or your I- religious ideology or you know anything that is major that you really feel strong about it. Well, first of all, you feel strong about it. And second of all, you've, you've thought about it for a long time. Yes. So, of course, you're not going to change your mind on the spot just because somebody brings up an argument that is new. However, what, that, what, what happens, at least, again, in my case, and it's, it turns out in the literature, the literature in social psychology sort of backs this up. It's like, so let's say I have a conversation with a friend and the friend makes some points that I don't have an answer for hmm. right, on the spot. But I ignored them on the spot. And then I, later on, like maybe a week later or a <laughs> month later, I find, yeah, that, that's, that's interesting. I, I didn't think about that. Yes. And then probably I'll just set it aside. But then another conversation happens with somebody else, you know, a couple of months later. And somebody else makes similar points. And, ah, uh, crap, this again. <laughs> and then the right. connection comes. And eventually the connection comes and he said, well, you know what? I might actually have been wrong about, about this particular thing or, you know, you change your mind. So there is research that shows that people do change their mind, but it takes time. Uh, it takes multiple exposures. Usually you don't change your mind on the spot just because somebody told you something. And ideally that multiple exposure is from different sources. That is, it's not that just because you go to the same person over and over and the same person tells you the same thing over and over that you're going to change your mind. Hmm. You're going to go to this person, then you hear from that, and then you read something else, or then you watch something on television, and then you hear on the radio, uh, and so on and so forth. And at some point, something clicks and says, all right, I think I think I now think differently about about that stuff. (laughs) So what you're saying is my post online isn't changing uh, people's minds that disagree with me. Not the on the spot. I posted, not on, not the, on spot. the spot. Not on the spot. I mean, you know, as I said, when I was in Tennessee, I was I occasionally debated creationists because that was the thing to do there. Uh, I wouldn't <laughs> recommend it, by the way, because debates are you know not a, not a particularly good format for for discussing ideas. But nevertheless, right? Uh, I knew that I wasn't going to change anybody's mind on the spot. But years later, I still get emails or letters from people that say, you know, I was at that debate you did like 20 years ago, and I certainly didn't believe what you were saying in the moment. But you kind of made me start thinking about stuff. And then, you know, a few years later, I actually did change my mind. Wow. That's amazing. But it is. You know, you, you're not going to, you're very rarely going to see the results of that, that sort of stuff. I tell you one thing that happens, however, that, it's, that is useful. And this is uh, an experience that I just had literally like two days ago. So on, uh, on uh, my blog, uh, I published something and somebody disagreed vehemently. So they just mm-hmm. like their first post was like, their first comment was like, in, on, on, on my nose, it's like, oh, I really, I can't believe you're, you know, you're writing this kind of thing. And, okay. So usually when that kind of <laughs> stuff happens, I do one or two things. Either I ignore it because I don't, I'm not bound to answer everybody's comments. I of just course. don't have the time. Or, as in this particular case, I say, well, okay, let's talk about this. So why do you think that? Right? So instead of answering, oh, you're an idiot, you know, why, why are you so stupid that you don't get what I just wrote? Uh, right. I say, well, let's talk about it. Let's, let's think. You know, two exchanges later, the guy said, I, I don't think we're that far from each other from, in terms of positions. And I, I appreciate the fact that you managed to turn a confrontational, something that started out as a confrontation, into an actual conversation. So right. it does work, but it takes time and effort, and you may not be able to see the results. Because yeah. you, know, you may convince somebody, but they are not going to write to you, uh, and therefore you, you, you'll <laughs> never know. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So what... So. Following on that, and this is kind of th- th- there's a there's a practical question at the end, but this is our last like uh, um, big question. So we have a variety of listeners: Christians, atheists, Muslims, Hindus, people that are from the, the left and the right politically in America. Um, what do you think, in your experience and your understanding, what what do you want to say to them? to say to our listeners about how to interact with each other on these topics? 
I would answer the way in which Aristotle actually answered that, that kind of question like 23, 2200 years ago. So Aristotle wrote an important book on rhetoric. And rhetoric uh, ha- is the art of persuasion, right? Essentially, it's it's you know, how yes. do you change people's minds? How do you interact with people? And Aristotle said, well, if you want to interact positively with people, if you want to give give them a chance to change your mind and maybe maybe agree with what you're saying, you have to have three things that you, you keep in mind in your in the way you interact with people. He called them uh, the logos, the pathos, and the ethos. These are the th- the Greek words, but the logos means you have to have good reasons and good facts on your side. So make sure you do your homework. Right. right. Make sure that if somebody says, well, how do you know that? You have an answer. Because if you don't have an answer, you lost people right there. It's like, ah, yes. okay, this, this guy is full of crap. He's just making <laughs> things up. Unless they agree the with you. And then they're like, of oh, course. yeah. Right. Um, so have the logos ready there. You have to have your good, good arguments. But good arguments by themselves are not going to convince many people. What you also need is the ethos. Ethos is basically is a reputation. It's it's like somebody people have to trust you, and so you have to work on a human level to show people that you are actually a nice guy, that you're right. actually trustworthy. Right. I still remember during one of my after one of my debates with a creationist, somebody came up to me and said, "You know, I don't I don't believe what what you were." you know, putting forth during the debate. But I have to say, uh, you seem like a really nice guy. (laughs) Okay, that's progress. Because if you see the other person as evil, as the enemy, as misguided, as stupid, and so on and so forth, that's the end of a discussion. You're not going to go anywhere. So that's the second component, the ethos. You have to make sure that people understand you're just like them, you're a human being, and you're doing your best. And the third is the pathos. Pathos means emotional involvement. Hmm. You have to make sure that other people understand that this thing, whatever it is you're talking about, actually matters. And it matters to them. Hmm. So, for instance, if we were having a conversation about COVID and, you know, should you get vaccinated or not, should you use masks or not, and so on and so forth. One thing you might want to bring up is like, well, are you concerned about your kids? getting uh, the virus are you yeah you know, everybody's concerned about their kids so it's like you know it matters to you it's not just you know it's this kind of this abstract thing that happens and you have nothing to do with it, it you yes. are the one that might end up in the icu or your kids might end up in the in the icu so surely that matters now just because you care about your kids of course it doesn't mean you're going to buy my own my my position on it but if you put those three things together right so yes. you have a good argument. You show that you actually are a reasonable person and you, you're interested, you're, you want to do the right thing. And you point out that these things actually matter. Well, now we got something. Now, now so we can good. actually have a conversation, right? And, and we can go somewhere. Otherwise, you know, if you, if you rely on only one of those three things, Aristotle says, don't even, don't waste your time. He says, don't, man, those are such wise words. Um, what, what projects are you working right now that you want to let the listeners know about? I'm working actually on a, I'm almost finished with a new book that, uh, looks at the relationship between politics and philosophy. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, maybe we can have a conversation about this next year when, when the book come, comes out. So it starts out, uh, the book starts out with a famous dialogue between Socrates, you know, the, the as I said, the, the arguably the most uh, famous philosopher in the Western tradition, right. and Alcibiades. Alcibiades was a young Athenian who was brilliant, you know, uh, handsome, rich. I mean, he had everything, basically. Right. And he happened to be also a student of Socrates and a friend of Socrates. And Alcibiades wanted to go into politics, which he did eventually, and wanted to shape the world and wanted to, you know, uh, shape Athens. 